Hello, I'm Dr. Clifton Bingham. I'm from the Division of Rheumatology at Johns Hopkins University, and I'm here today to talk to you about the human kinome and intracellular signaling. You've just heard from Dr. Scott Plevy, who is speaking to you about T-cell effector function. I'm now going to speak to you about the events that take place when any cell becomes triggered through a receptor on its cell surface. The objectives of my talk are to define the human kinome and describe the basic role of this family of enzymes. We'll describe the function of intracellular kinases in transmitting information from the cellular environment to the nucleus. And then we'll relate the importance of the key kinases from preclinical knockout models and clinically discuss the risks and benefits of therapeutic agents that target kinases that are in development for the treatment of autoimmune diseases. I'm going to begin this with a case. A 47-year-old woman with rheumatoid arthritis for two and a half years failed to respond to her initial treatment with first-line therapies, including methotrexate and three TNF-alpha inhibitors. She also developed injection site reactions and infusion reactions with these agents. She comes to see you and she continues to have very active joint disease with a high number of swollen and tender joints, elevation in her acute phase reactants, the said rate and CRP, and significant difficulty with her activities of daily living. You're now considering starting an oral kinase inhibitor that has recently been approved to treat rheumatoid arthritis. The questions that we'll review today are what is a kinase, what is the mechanism of action of the drug that may be used, and then to think about the safety implications of this form of therapy. So what are kinases and what is the kinome? Kinases are enzymes that catalyze phosphorylation reactions of amino acids. A protein becomes phosphorylated through a hydroxyl group that accepts a phosphate molecule from ATP and then becomes phosphorylated. The word kinase derives from kineticos, the Greek word for, t for motion. Remember this word motion as we go through the rest of the talk. Now kinases are not a single enzyme, but in fact there are more than 500 different kinases in the human genome. Here we see a, a tree structure showing the different kinases and the different kinase families. But this is just to uh, remind you that there are multiple kinases within the organism that help to transmit signals in the cell. Now kinases transfer phosphate molecules onto certain amino acids. The amino acids that are important for phosphate transfer are tyrosine, serine, and threonine, all shown below phosphorylated. The free hydroxyl group on each of these amino acids serves as a phosphate acceptor. When the phosphate is transferred onto these molecules, they become active. The substrate protein can either undergo a conformational change, change its cellular localization, or now become able to interact with other proteins. Why are these kinases important? Well, phosphates and the transfer of phosphates are required for intracellular signal transduction. Kinases serve to propagate signals in cells that are, that are triggered when a, when a receptor is bound by its ligand and other forms of cellular perturbation. Now kinases not only transmit signals, but they can also amplify signals within cells. If we look at a model of signal transduction, you see at the top a, a receptor on the cell surface. And you see the primary transduction event that occurs when that receptor binds there is a signal that is transferred. There may be scaffolding molecules that hold proteins together. There is a relay of signal that occurs. And then this is amplified through different circuits within the cell. The signals become uh, integrated. There is spread that takes place. This can result in anchoring that occurs of one protein to the membrane or other uh, intracellular compartments. And this may also result in modulation of signals through the translocation of signaling molecules into the nucleus leading to gene transcription. Now this is a complex diagram that outlines the number of different types of receptors and the downstream events that take place as a result of receptor ligand binding interactions. We will talk about many of these different pathways in the remainder of the lecture today, but we will not discuss all of the signal transduction pathways that take place within a cell. Kinases play an important role in many of these signal transduction events, but are not involved in all intracellular signaling that takes place. As I've said before, the importance of kinases is phosphate transfer. 
in this intracellular signaling process. One way to think about kinases and what they're involved in is sending a signal. So the Olympics recently took place in London, UK, and this is the transmission of the signal from the Olympic torch. You see it is lit in Athens and then passed from one person to another person, the fire from one to another through a series of different locations within the United Kingdom via multiple mechanisms of transfer on foot, on boat, in wheelchairs, in a balloon, on a zip line, and back on another boat. All of these are different methods of transferring that same fire that started at the beginning in, in, in Olympus and then lands at the final Olympic events. Now imagine, if you will, that that fire is a phosphate molecule. And as we think about signal transduction mediated by kinases, it is these phosphates that are passed from one to another to another at different sites within a cell by different carriers, ultimately moving a signal from the cell surface into the nucleus. Here we see a diagram of the transmission of the Olympic torch as it reached the United Kingdom, went throughout the country, and ultimately landed in London. Now, if we think about a cell that has a receptor on its surface, is the start of the transduction process, moving along throughout the different uh, places in the cell, ultimately resulting in the nucleus becoming activated. So keep this in mind as you think about the role of kinases within the cell. Now, kinases exist as various families in various forms, and it is somewhat important to understand some of these general concepts in understanding how kinases work. The first large family of kinases are called receptor kinases. These kinases have an intrinsic kinase activity as part of the molecule itself. These are intracellular membrane proteins and oftentimes are receptors for cytokines, for FC uh, receptors, for immunoglobulins, for B cells. And the kinase is an intrinsic part of some of these receptors. When a ligand becomes bound, two of these receptors associate with one another and phosphorylation occurs. It is when this phosphorylation occurs that signals are allowed to be transmitted. Now a similar method of kinase association can be non-covalent linkage of a kinase molecule with an intracellular receptor. And as is the case with an intrinsic tyrosine kinase, these non-receptor tyrosine kinases become associated with the receptor. When the receptors co-localize with one another, phosphorylation occurs on the kinase, and the kinase can then transmit a signal by transferring phosphate molecules to other uh, proteins. Now we talked about scaffolding in the initial diagram. A scaffold is a molecule that can become phosphorylated and can hold other proteins together. It can bring uh, proteins together in apposition with one another, and when proteins become docked to scaffolds, they can then transmit effective signals. Now, kinases can also facilitate protein-protein interactions and allow proteins to come in contact with one another that would normally not associate with one another, and this is another mechanism of signal transduction through kinases. And then kinases can also serve as amplification uh, mediators. So a kinase becomes activated and then transmits a signal not only to one kinase below, but potentially to two. And then each of these then spreading their signals to other proteins within the cell. Another mechanism of amplification after kinase interaction is potentially something like the release of intracellular calcium from a compartment that allows movement and conformational changes of other proteins, further facilitating signal transduction. So there are multiple methods that not only can a kinase go from one to another to another, but can also amplify signals by acting on multiple downstream intermediates. And then this regulation can be based on the threshold, the amplitude, the duration, and the appropriate localization of the downstream proteins. And this ultimately determines the signal strength. Now one can imagine that modulation could occur at multiple steps along this pathway, turning on, turning off, turning up, turning down. And in fact, this is how drugs that target kinases are developed, to exploit these different proteins that are in the cascade that allow the signal transduction event to take place. Now, there are multiple groups of kinases 
we've spoken about the receptor tyrosine kinases that have intrinsic kinase activity themselves. Now these are typical of many forms of growth factors. Stem cell factor, the receptor C-kit, the receptors for platelet growth factor, epidermal growth factor, and vascular uh, growth factors, as well as the BCRC able translocation that occurs in chronic myelogenous leukemia. The receptor for TGF beta is also a receptor tyrosine kinase. We've spoken also about non receptor tyrosine kinases, and these are typified by the SART family kinases and SICK or spleen tyrosine kinase and ZAP70, a kinase that's important in T cell activation. These non-receptor tyrosine kinases are often associated with immunoglobulin and FC receptors, the B cell receptor, the T cell receptor, and what are called ITAM bearing receptors that allow for phosphate transfer on the receptor tail. A very important class of kinases are the Janus associated kinases or JAKs. These come in four flavors, JAK1, JAK2, JAK3, and TIC2. We'll talk a little bit about some of these further on in the, in, the, in the talk, but remember that the JAK kinases are associated with many different cytokine receptors. We'll go through a list of these very shortly, but these include the cytokine interleukin-2, quite important in T-cell development, as well as the interferons, not only alpha, but beta and gamma, as well as the erythropoietin receptor. As JAKs become phosphorylated, they phosphorylate downstream uh, uh, molecules known as STATs, these dimerize and ultimately trans, uh, mit, uh, translocate to the nucleus. Other families of kinases include the mitogen activated protein kinases or MAP kinases, and these also come in a number of different types and names that we'll discuss briefly. I can't cover all of the kinases in this talk, but I will talk a little bit about the PI3 kinases and protein kinases that are also involved in signal transduction events that are mediated through receptors such as the T cell receptor. As I've said, kinases can be linked or can be classified according to whether or not they phosphorylate tyrosine or they phosphorylate serine and threonine. And here are some of these kinases that I spoke with you about in the previous slide, showing whether they fall as tyrosine kinases or as serine threonine kinases. And on this slide, you can also see the kinase activity that is associated with certain transmembrane receptors, as well as the kinase activity that is associated with intracellular proteins. Now, if we go back to the receptor tyrosine kinases, remember these are the ones with intrinsic kinase activity in the tail of the receptor. This is a complicated diagram, but if you look, you see the phosphate molecules that are attached to the tail of the receptor. And then there are multiple interactions that occur as a result of this phosphorylation. Interaction with other intracellular kinases, interactions with small g proteins, and signal transduction that occurs through a number of different pathways into the cell nucleus resulting in activation, or in the case of a mast cell, as shown here through the stem cell factor receptor, mast cell activation that can also result in degranulation of the cell. Now, growth factors are commonly associated with receptor tyrosine kinases. Here, I've shown you the case for, C for, for the KIT receptor, but also is the case for the EGF receptor, PDGF receptor, the VEGF receptor, and also the BCR able translocation that occurs in CML. The TGF beta receptor is also a receptor tyrosine kinase. However, TGF signals through a different set of molecules that I'm not going to discuss in this talk. An important family of kinases are the JAK kinases. As mentioned, these are linked to a number of cytokine receptors. I've given a long list here of the, of the cytokines that we know as, are associate with JAK kinases. These are linked to the interleukins 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 9, 10, 11, 12, 15, 21, the interferons, erythropoietin, thrombopoietin, and GMCSF. Now, one important group of cytokines that are linked via JAK transmission are those cytokines that share a common gamma chain, and these are the interleukins 2, 4, 7, 9, 15, and 21. These are particularly important because deficiencies in the gamma chain in humans as well as in knockout mice are associated with severe combined immunodeficiency syndromes and significant 
abnormalities in T-cell functioning as a result of interference with IL-2 signal transduction. Now, as mentioned before, the JAK molecules are associated with, transmit, with, with receptors. They are not a receptor tyrosine kinase themselves. But as a receptor becomes phosphorylated, the JAK molecules become phosphorylated, and then they lead to the phosphorylation of what are called STAT molecules. Once STAT molecules become phosphorylated, they can bind with one another and then translocate to the nucleus to initiate gene transcription. There are a number of JAK molecules, as we discussed, and there are also a number of STAT molecules that can come together, either as homodimers or as heterodimers. And different cytokines and different, uh, are linked with different JAKs and different STATs. Another important kinase is the spleen tyrosine kinase, which is now the target of therapy for treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. This is part of a larger family of kinases for which ZAP70 is also a member. ZAP70 is associated with T-cell signal transduction. But SIC is associated with many other forms of receptors, including FC receptors, those are the receptors for immunoglobulins, the B-cell receptor, some receptors on the osteoclasts, as well as some integrin receptors. And as we saw with the receptor tyrosine kinases previously, SIC in green, shown next to the receptor, once phosphorylated, will initiate a series of downstream cascading events that occur through multiple different signaling pathways. These can result in degranulation of a cell like a mast cell, or can result in signal transduction events that occur, or can result in changes in intracellular local, uh, locomotion and other events that take place within a cell. So you see that it's not just the kinase that initially becomes involved, but it initiates a series of events that occur downstream mediated through multiple other pathways. Now MAP kinases are another family that we've discussed uh, briefly. MAP kinase can also be uh, coupled to a number of different receptor types directly, or they can be downstream from other signaling molecules. Now MAP kinases represent a large family of kinases where one MAP kinase can phosphorylate another and another in a series of events that cascade. In each of these events, phosphate molecules are transferred and ultimately can result in multiple different changes within the cell that can range from changes in the protein activity itself to gene expression and other events that take place. The groups of MAP kinases are ERKs 1 and 2, P38, and June kinase are junk. Now, these have been looked at as targets of therapy in autoimmune diseases, especially the P38 kinase inhibitors. And unfortunately, these have not served to be efficacious molecules. However, there is still work going on to look at the roles of MAP kinases as a potential therapeutic target, not only in autoimmune diseases, but also in certain forms of cancer. As I mentioned, there are a number of other kinases that can occur and downstream of those that we've already talked about. These include the protein kinase family, protein kinase A, B, and C, as well as PI3 kinase, or the phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase, that is involved in lipid mediator transmission within the cell. And as you see here, through a G protein linked receptor or through a receptor tyrosine kinase, there is an amplification that can occur through multiple different pathways within the cell that lead to upregulation of target proteins and gene transcription. These can couple to other receptors, including antigen receptors, FC receptors, G protein receptors, toll like receptors, and cytokine receptors. As we look at a complex event, such as T cell signaling, there are a number of events that now take place, which you can appreciate through this discussion of kinases. Here you see ZAP70 that's associated with the receptor for the T cell. And as we talked about with six signaling, ZAP70 phosphorylation will result in activation of multiple downstream pathways through those kinases that we discussed on the previous slides. Similarly, in the case of B-cell receptor signaling, you can see that there are SARC family kinases associated with this receptor, as well as SIC, again resulting in a cascading set of events that occur after receptor binding. And finally, we have other pathways that are mediated through kinases that I haven't had the chance to discuss, but include the I-kappa-B kinase, 
which is important in T-cell receptor signaling, leading to the activation of NF-kappa-B and NF-kappa-B associated target genes. Now when we talk about kinases, we also think what might be the way to turn off a kinase. And as we know from Newton, there is a third law that says for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Similarly, this is a yin and yang phenomenon where kinases are turned on, but there are also processes within the cell that are able to turn this off. Now we've talked about kinases placing phosphates onto proteins and usually activating cells. But phosphatases are those molecules within a cell whose function is to remove a phosphate. And these often serve as inactivators or off switches to the activity of kinases. They can, however, be activating for some other proteins that are downstream. Phosphorylation can also result in changes to proteins that target them for degradation through intracellular mechanisms. So if we look at endogenous mechanisms of kinase inactivation, you see that there are phosphatases here demonstrated as SHP, which take away the phosphate that is on a molecule and lead to inactivation. Now, ubiquitination is a process of, of targeting cells for degradation within the cells through the proteasome. I think about the proteasome as really the garbage disposal within the cell that degrades proteins. Phosphatases can target cells for ubiquitination that then marks that pro, uh, protein to go through the proteasome pathway. And finally, ubiquitination can also result in the movement of molecules within the cell to the lysosomes to undergo lysosomal de degradation or even recycling within the cell. So you see that phosphatases are coupled not only with turning off kinases but other intracellular processes. So as we think about the endogenous kinase inhibitors, you then begin to think about, well, how might we be able to target these kinases in autoimmune, inflammatory, and malignant diseases? You wonder what are the potential advantages of these kinase inhibitors, and which kinases might be considered as a target of therapy. So why would we want to develop kinase inhibitors? Well, first of all, these are small molecules, and they have attached to the end of their name INIB, or INIBs, so that you can recognize from a generic name a kinase inhibitor. Now with small molecules, you can use medicinal chemistry and high throughput screening techniques to rapidly identify potential targets of kinases. Usually these are designed to target the kinase domain of the molecule. They are orally available as small molecules, thus they don't require injections or infusions as a biological molecule may and they're not limited to targeting cell surface molecules as a protein biologic molecule would be. Now there is efficacy that has been demonstrated for some oral kinase inhibitors in rheumatoid arthritis that is similar to that of the injectable and infusible biologics. This might make sense as we would target the downstream kinases that are linked to certain cytokines that we, we have shown to be important in a disease like rheumatoid arthritis. Now there are also drawbacks to oral molecules. Kinases, as we've seen, are ubiquitous throughout the cell and are essential for normal intracellular functions. It may be very difficult because of this complex kinase family of more than 500 members to achieve a specific effect on a singular kinase. And also, many kinases have overlapping and redundant functions, so that if you develop an inhibitor to a singular kinase, there may be other kinases within the cell that can have similar types of functions. And finally, with oral molecules, there's always the possibility of an off-target effect that may be unanticipated. Now, I return to our example of the Olympics. Here, let's think about the relay and think about athletes as our kinases that are transferring the baton, athletes that are in motion in moving that baton from one place to another. Now if we think about kinases in this manner, we might think about what could slow down this means of signal transduction. Now in an athlete, it could be an injury. It could be a muscle strain. It could be a fracture. It could be inflammation that occur in the joints. It could be some form of arthritis developing all of which would inhibit that athlete's ability to transmit or pass that baton from one person to another. These are the targets that you could exploit to turn down that relay and its effectiveness. So let's think about what types of 
of kinases we could look at in the human being that could be used to turn down signal transduction. Now we've spoken about the JAK-STAT pathway of signal transduction earlier. And you can also look at what knockout mice have shown in terms of knocking down or knocking out these particular kinases of the JAK family. Now we've discussed that the JAK family is associated with the common gamma chain cytokines that are very important in T cell development. So not surprisingly, when you knock down JAK1, you can have severe combined immunodeficiency as a phenotype. Thus, you might anticipate that a molecule that inhibits JAK1 could make individuals more susceptible to infection, and you could also see effects that are related to other cytokines, such as interleukin-6 and the interferons that could also be associated with susceptibility to infection. Now with JAK2, you see that this is a, cytokine, or this is a, a molecule associated with erythropoietin and with thrombopoietin, as well as interferon and GMCSF. So you could anticipate that an inhibitor of JAK2 could result in neutropenia, could result in anemia, or could result in thrombocytopenia, as well as an increased risk of infection mediated through the interferons. And finally, with JAK3, you see linkage as well with multiple different cytokines, including the gamma chain. And TIC2, another member of the family, associated with interleukin-12. So as you see, there are knockout phenotypes that occur and then predicted side effects that can also be seen in humans. Now with the JAK inhibitors, I'll discuss two that have been looked at in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. These include tofacitinib, which is an inhibitor predominantly of JAKs 1 and 2, but also to some extent JAK, I'm sorry, JAKs 1 and 3, but also to some extent with JAK2, and baricitinib, an inhibitor of JAK1 and JAK2. The side effects, perhaps not surprisingly after the slide that we've been through before, include infections, viral infections, particularly herpes zoster, neutropenia, hyperlipidemia, elevation in liver function tests, and anemia. Now, multiple kinase inhibitors, or JAK inhibitors, what are now called JAKinibs, are being looked at for multiple forms of cancer in which these molecules are upregulated. We spoke about the molecule sick or spleen tyrosine kinase, and this is also the target of a specific inhibitor that's being looked at in rheumatoid arthritis. The side effects of sick inhibition have included infection, neutropenia, LFT abnormalities, anemia, GI side effects, and hypertension. All of these a consequence of the multiple pathways that are inhibited when you knock out a proximal signal transduction enzyme. And finally, the receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors have been a large family that have been targeted, especially in hematologic diseases. The first and best known is imatinib, which was developed to inhibit the CML BCR ABL translocation. But it was also found that this inhibitor also bound to the inhibitor C kit and is effective in gastric stromal cell tumors and some cases of mastocytosis. Interestingly, this has also resulted in the identification of a mutant form of the platelet-derived growth factor and a mechanism for many cases of hypereosinophilic syndrome. Imatinib and others have been studied in systemic sclerosis and some other autoimmune diseases. Other receptor tyrosine kinases are in development mostly for cancer. So returning to our case, the kinase inhibitor that you're considering predominantly inhibits JAK1 and JAK3, but it may have some activity against JAK2. What are the major concerns that you face in terms of thinking about safety for your patient in using such a molecule? We've talked about the JAK inhibitor and the uh, potential as a result of the knockout studies. So the general classes would be infections, a need for laboratory monitoring, and also evaluation for GI symptoms. What types of changes in laboratory values might you see? As we think about the JAK-STAT signal transduction pathway, you may see decreases in neutrophils, decreases in hemoglobin, increases in transaminases and lipids and cholesterol, and an improvement in acute phase reactants. And as we think about a patient moving on to such a therapy, are there any specific tests or precautions you would consider before initiating this type of therapy? Some of the things would be a general screening for infections, 
as would be the case with other biological response modifiers that we use for treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. But in particular, with this class of molecules, because of the impact on T cells as well as interferon signaling, there is an increased risk of zoster that's been seen. So you may wish to consider immunization before starting therapy with such a molecule. And finally, because of the effect on lipids, a baseline cholesterol panel, as has been the case when we look at interleukin-6 inhibition as well. And not surprisingly, such a molecule may inhibit signal transduction through interleukin-6. So we see the same types of side effects in terms of cholesterol, in terms of liver function tests, in terms of neutropenia that we see with IL-6 inhibition through a biological therapy targeting the cell surface molecule, the interleukin-6 receptor, or the cytokine interleukin-6. So as we look at the information regarding kinases, we can come up with some general summary comments from this lecture today. The first is that kinases are critical proteins that are involved in signal transduction. They facilitate the transfer of phosphate between molecules to activate cells. Kinases are widely expressed and are needed for both normal homeostatic function, but they may also be upregulated in states of pathobiology. The kinases are targets for small molecule oral inhibitors that may have effects that are similar to some of the biological agents that are currently used in the treatment of autoimmune diseases. However, because of their multiple downstream effects and because of the examples that we've seen from knockout models as well as deficiencies in certain uh, kinases, there are some adverse events that can be thought about if you understand the roles of these in normal cell signaling and activation. The information from today's lectures can be found in the molecular biology of the cell as well as Janeway's textbook of immunobiology. And finally, I'd like to thank the Cleveland Clinic for the opportunity to speak today, thank you for your attention, and hope that you will remember some of the information regarding kinases in transmitting signals throughout the cells as well as their role in health and pathobiology. Thank you.